In the last video, we showed you some metals and the ores from which they came. We showed you copper and its ore, tin and its ore, and here's some iron and its ore. The curious thing about these metals is once they were rendered from their ores and allowed to sit in wet conditions, they seem to revert back to their non-metallic state, the state in which they're found in nature. Here, take a look at this. So here are four pieces of steel, which is essentially iron. This one has been protected, but the others were left out in the elements for extended periods of time. The second one here was dipped in water and allowed to sit for about a day or two. This third one is about three or four days moist. And as time goes on, you can see after over a week, this fourth one is almost completely brown, showing that it's, the metal is losing its metallic luster and reverting back to its original form before it was smelted. This next set of, of metals is aluminum. The one on top has been protected, but the one on the bottom has been let sit in the elements for about four to five days. And notice that it's, uh, after being exposed to water and air for that much time, it's built up a, a gray coating, which I was able to rub off with the sandpaper. So even aluminum will revert back to its original form if set out in the elements for an extended period of time. Now copper, which is actually considered to be pretty much inert, not as inert as gold, but inert nonetheless, even copper will start to corrode and turn back to its non-metallic form when set out in the elements, as you can see here. So alchemists knew that you can convert shiny, pure metals into their non-shiny, non-metallic form, like iron into rust. And then you can convert rust back into iron by heating it. But they had no explanation as to how or why that happened until 1700, when somebody came up with an idea that maybe there are two kinds of airs, the normal air around us and a new type of air called phlogiston. Phlogiston was used to explain why some objects are flammable. Wood, for example, we already said that it contains more air than earth, and that's why it floats. But now, alchemists are saying the type of air that comprises wood is different than the air around us. It's phlogiston. And when you have phlogiston in an object and you heat it, the object will combust. Here you go. What they believed then in 1700 was this piece of wood is combusting, phlogiston is released. And as the phlogiston is released, what's left behind is just a small amount of earth and ash. And the process produces flame. Furthermore, they believe that water could be mixed with phlogiston to create flammable liquids, like alcohol. Watch this. It will burn. Not sure if that flame's visible. I hope it is. This is getting mighty hot. It is flammable, flammable liquid. They believe that phlogiston was being released from this liquid. And when the fire goes out, what's left is pure water. So this new invented air called phlogiston was used to explain flammability. But it was also thought that metals, pure shiny metals, contain phlogiston. And when the metal lost its luster, like for example when iron turns into rust, it was assumed that the phlogiston was released into the air. This idea made sense because alchemists 100 years ago, hundreds of years ago, knew that metals could be burned. Take a look at this demonstration to see what happens to iron filings when we drop them in an open flame.
In 1750, it was believed that the sparks resulting from sprinkling iron over the flame were caused from the rapid release of phlogiston from the iron because the residue from the reaction that landed on the table turned out to be rust, the same material that iron turns into when exposed to moisture over time. The only difference is speed. Just like the stick and the alcohol releasing heat and light in the form of flame as the phlogiston was released rapidly, so too did the iron glow as it released its phlogiston rapidly. And this happens to almost all metals. That's the basis for fireworks. If you, if you crush up any metal and, sp and sprinkle it over a flame, it will release colorful sparks, and the colors will be different for each metal. So this idea of phlogiston release causing these sparks and this light and this flame was so compelling that almost everyone believed it. Even a man named Henry Cavendish, who was the most influential scientist of the 18th century. His methods of investigation and measurement were so precise and so amazing that he actually discovered the density of the Earth. He also, in the 1780s, discovered the composition of air. So he was an extremely influential scientist, and yet he believed that phlogiston was real. In fact, in 1766, he did an experiment in which he thought he discovered phlogiston. Watch how he did it. Cavendish was experimenting with this, discovered hundreds of years before his time, but still not well understood in 1766. No one really understood what acids were comprised of. He did know, however, that when the acid was mixed with metals, not all metals, but most, that a very vigorous reaction took place in which a strange type of air, we call it a gas today, is produced. And as it's produced, the metal seems to lose its shiny, lustrous quality and dissolve into the acid. He believed that what he discovered was a method of releasing phlogiston from metals without burning it like is done with the stick, alcohol, and iron filings seen earlier. Now, when he collected this gas seen here evolving from the metal, he was surprised to find that it was lighter than air, but this made him even more certain that he had discovered phlogiston. And the last thing he did that made him certain was that when he turned the vessel over, he stoppered it just like I'm doing here, turned it over, and opened the stopper the gas rolls like a hot air balloon, and when he put a match near it, here's what happened. Watch carefully. Cavendish thought that he had discovered the elusive phlogiston.